So let's talk about the powers of matrices. First of all, let's define something called the identity matrix. So what is the identity matrix? It's a square matrix, it's an Rn by N, such that its entries are the Kronecker or Dirac delta function, delta ij. That said, the entries of the identity matrix denoted as i, uppercase i, are 1 whenever i is j and 0 elsewhere. So if we take a look at the identity matrix, it's going to look something like this. 1, 1, all 1s on the diagonal components and 0 elsewhere. Now this matrix is going to occur a lot in linear algebra because the identity matrix is the equivalent of the unity of 1 in terms of real numbers. That said, if you grab i and multiply it by any matrix, it's going to yield that matrix. Okay, Whether you multiply from the left or right, it will give you that matrix. Let's see how this works. Let's see why it gives A. Let me grab a matrix called, let's say, 2, 6, 1, 7, 2, 9, minus 1, 5, and a minus 4. Multiply it by the suitable identity matrix. So in this case, it's of size 3 by 3. You shall get, so we grab this, multiply it with that column, we get 2, and a 6, then a 1, then we get a 7, and a 2, and a 9, then a minus 1, 5, minus 4, right? So we got, again, this matrix. So keep in mind that the identity matrix plays a critical role in linear algebra, because when I grab a matrix A, multiplied by the identity i, whether on the left or right, you're always going to get that matrix a. Therefore, the identity matrix acts like 1 in the real number system. So let's define the kth power of a matrix. So given a square matrix, again, square, we can define the so-called kth power of that matrix. And what is the kth power of a? It's when you multiply a with itself k times. So that said, a to the power 0 is, by convention, the identity. a to the power 1 is a itself. a square is a times a. a cube is a times a times a, which is also a times a square or a square a, and so on. So let's give an example on that. Say so I've got the following 2 by 2 matrix, 1, 1, 1, 0. Now I would like to compute successive powers. How do I do that? Well, start by a square, choose a by a. You will get, you get a 2 here, 1, 1, 1, okay? Then a cube, you grab a square, multiply it by a, a square is here, get a 2, 1, 1, 1, multiply it by a, you get 3, 2, 2, 1. Then a4 is a cube by a, that is 3, 2, 2, 1, which is 5, 3, 3, 2. a5 is a4 by a, which is 5, 3, 3, 2, by 1, 1, 1, 0, that is 5, 5, 3. a6 is a5 by a, which is 13, 8, 8, 5. So yeah, this is how you work on to compute powers of a matrix. By the way, this matrix A is referred to as Fibonacci matrix. Now you might be wondering about the famous Fibonacci sequence. Well, it's related. Why is that? Because if you take a look at, because if you take a look at the entries sitting at 1, 1 of the matrix, they are actually the Fibonacci sequence. So 1, 2, 3, 5, they actually form the Fibonacci sequence. So 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. That's why this matrix is called the Fibonacci matrix, because it generates through its successive powers the Fibonacci sequence. Another example would be the following matrix. So computing a square is a by a, which will give you, doing that again, to compute a cube, so it's a squared by a, and again, a power 4 is a cubed by a. Note that the elements in positions 1, 2, and 2, 1 follow a specific pattern. That is, the element in position 1, 2 is always 4n. This guy is 4, this guy is 4 times 2, this guy is 4 times 3, this guy is 4 times 4. So if I were to write a power n, I can only guess that the element sitting at 1, 2 is 4n. 
right? Now the element sitting at 2, 1, so minus 9, minus 18, minus 27, minus 36 are actually multiples of 9. So this guy is minus 9. This guy is minus 9 times 2, minus 9 times 3, and a minus 9 times 4, right? So we get a minus 9n, right? Can we say the same thing about element sitting at 1, 1? So 7, 13, 19, 25. Well, yes, you can actually go ahead and verify that all these components are generated by 6n plus 1. And for the last component sitting at 2, 2, so minus 5, minus 11, minus 17, and minus 23, it's actually generated by minus 6n plus 1. Right. This is not a formal proof, it's just using observation or sort of pattern recognition. We can actually prove this using mathematical induction. So what I mean by mathematical induction is that, let's go ahead and write A again over here, 7, 4, minus 9, and minus 5. So we would like to prove by mathematical induction that A to the power N is indeed 1 plus 6N, 4N, minus 9N, and 1 minus 6n. Well, let's check if this is true, at least for the base cases. So for a power is 0, you're going to get 1, 0, 0, 1. For a power 1, you're going to get 1 plus 6, 4, minus 9, and a 1 minus 6. That is 7, 4, minus 9, and minus 5, right? So seems to be good for the first few cases. So let's formulate the induction hypothesis. So assume a n is actually 1 plus 6 n, 4 n, minus 9 n, and 1 minus 6 n. The task here is to show that, given this, can I actually say a n plus 1 is 1 plus 6 n plus 1, 4 n plus 1, minus 9 into n plus 1, and 1 minus 6 into n plus 1. Is this actually true? Well, let's find out. So to compute an plus 1, it is nothing other than an times a. An is given in the hypothesis that is 1 plus 6n, 4n, minus 9n, and 1 minus 6n. Go ahead and multiply it by a, that is 7, 4, minus 9, and minus 5. You're going to get 7 into 1 plus 6n minus 36n. 4 into 1 plus 6n minus 20n minus 63n plus 9 into 6n minus 1 and minus 36n plus 5 into 6n minus 1, right? So expanding all its entries, we get 7 plus 42n minus 36n 4 plus 24n minus 20n minus 63n plus 54n minus 9 and minus 36n plus 30n minus 5. Go ahead and do further simplification. So 42 minus 36 is 6. Thus we're left with 6n plus 7 and 4 plus 4n minus 9n plus 9 and minus 6n minus 5. Right? Notice that the first entry could be written as 1 plus 6n plus 1. The element sitting at 1, 2 could be written as 4 into n plus 1. The element sitting at entry 2, 1 could be written as minus 9 into n plus 1. And last but not least, we can write the last entry as 1 minus 6n plus 1. So, indeed, n plus 1 could be written as such, given that you start from the induction hypothesis. So, so an is given by the following formula. So one last example of matrix powers is a result from graph theory. So a graph, as you can see in front of you, is a set of vertices and connections between those vertices are referred to as edges. You have seen many graphs in real life. For example, a map of the interstate highway system is a graph, as is the airline route map. At the back of those magazines you find on airline flights. Now let's say we have the following graph. We see that a path from one vertex V to another vertex W is a sequence of edges that connect V to W. So let's say my V is A, my W is C. I can go from A to C by passing through B or A, B, E, C and so on. So those edges or collection of edges are referred to as path. The edges that I need to walk to go from a certain node to another or a certain vertex to another is referred to as a path. For instance, let's say I want to go from A to F. So what are the possible paths? I can go A, B, F. 
So to go from A to F, we've got the following path. A, then B, then F, or A, B, D, F, A, B, D, F, or A, B, C, E, B, F, right? A, B, C, E, B, F. Now the length of a path between two vertices is the number of edges that must be crossed in moving from one to the other. So this path, so the first path has length equal to two, second one, length equal to three, and the last one, length equal to five, right? In general, if a graph has n vertices, we can define the so-called adjacency matrix of the graph or associated to the graph. That is of size n by n, so it depends on the number of vertices, which tells us the location of edges. It's a binary matrix, that is, it contains either one or zeros, and it is in some references denoted by ADJ, the adjacency, ADJ. So for the graph that you see in front of you, we can generate the adjacency matrix as such. So just label the columns and rows by the vertices A, B, C, D, E, F. Same thing here, A, B. So the way we fill this matrix is either by assigning ones or zeros. So you ask yourself this question, you stand at a certain row, say the one corresponding to A, and you check the vertices connected to A. The only vertex connected to A is B. So I assign one to B and zero elsewhere. Let's stand at B. The vertices connected to B are A, D, F, E, and C. So everything except B itself, right? So one everywhere except for B. You can do the same thing for C, D, E, and F. So we get the following. Now, how does the power of the matrix show up here? So let's, for the moment, compute the squared of the adjacency matrix. That is A, D, J square. Squaring this matrix, you will get the following. Doing it one more time, you get the following matrix. So you've got the adjacency matrix, its squared matrix, and the cubic matrix. If we take a look at the squared one, we can actually get the number of possible paths of length 2 between any two vertices. So if we were interested in going from C to E, we can see that there is only one path of length 2. So going back here from C to E, if we're interested in all paths of length 2, there's only one. And what is it? C, B, E. That's it. Now if we want to go from E to E itself, so E to E, we have two paths of length 2. So what are they? It's ECE, so going to C, then coming back, and EBE, going to B, then coming back, right? Now, if we look at adjacent cube, it tells us the number of paths of length 3, right? So for example, if I'm interested in going from B to A, so B to A, I have five paths of length 3. So going back here, B to A, what are the possible paths between B to A that are of size 3? Well, let's start. We've got B, A, B, A. So going from B to A, then B, then A. This is 1. There should be only 5. The second one is B, D, B, A. The third one is B, C, B, A, right? So B, C, B. B, A. The fourth one is B, E, B, A. And the last one is B, F, B, A. Right? And note that those matrices adjacent square, cube, four, and so on are all symmetric. What does it mean? It means that to go from B to A, it's the same as going from A to B. You take the same path, right? So going, f so we can reverse each path of length three, for example, or length five, right? Or simply by looking at only adjacent, it's also symmetric. That is, if you want to go from C to D, you cannot. Same thing, you cannot go from D to C, right? This is zero, so is this. So mathematically, you can say that adjacent, if you look at its i jth entry, it's the same as looking at the j ith entry. And this also applies to any power k. So just keep in mind, if you're working in graph theory, taking a look at 
the kth power of the adjacency matrix tells you the number of path of length k. Okay? Now, in future lectures, we're going to talk about the symmetric matrix and its properties. Right? So, this is it for this lecture. We talked about a lot of stuff, starting by the identity matrix, which is the equivalent of the number 1 in the real number system. Right. We introduced the kth power of a matrix, which is multiplying the matrix by itself k times. And we gave a small example. Actually, we gave three examples. The first one is generating the power of the Fibonacci matrix. The second one is recognizing a certain pattern through successive exponentiation or powers. So in this case, we got the following formula of a power n. And we proved it by induction, right? So we assume that the formula of a power n is the one we feel it is, right? The one we guess. And then we try to prove it by induction, and it worked. Last but not least, we give an example through graph theory. That is, we define the adjacency matrix, which is a matrix of 1 and 0. So you assign 1 if there is a certain path going from vertex i to vertex j, else a 0 if there is not. And it turns out that if we take a look at successive powers of the adjacency matrix, so adjacency power k tells us the number of path of size or length k, right? For example, if I want to go from vertex b to vertex a, and I see the number 5, that means that there is 5 path of length 3. What are they? We just enumerated them over here. Okay? So that's about it. If you found this lecture beneficial, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, just leave a comment down in the comment section below, and I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Thank you so much, and I'll see you.